My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Chelsea Hernandez is an entrepreneur of a homegrown urban market garden that focuses on producing high volume crops to sell to restaurants and clients. Chelsea is extremely passionate about what she does and it shows in the crops that she produces. She has a phenomenal life story that has not always been easy, but she never gave up and does what she loves. Please welcome Chelsea Hernandez. So Chelsea, what is it that you do? Where are you from? And I'm excited to get to know where this passion of yours came from. Awesome. Great to be here talking with you about my project. It's been about a year and a half in the making of planning and just trying to even figure out where I'm going with it. So Mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I am starting an urban farm or market garden, which just means it's a fancy term for a really big garden in the middle of a city or suburban setting. That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah. That produced this focus on producing high rotation, high volume crops to sell at market and to restaurants and other types of clients. Beautiful. My business name is Carousel Urban Farms, which is French for heart and soil. So with just, yeah, so with that name, you can kind of already tell what I care about, which is not just growing food, but enriching my community with the food that I grow and the environment that I create around that. Absolutely. And you are so passionate about it. I can tell with everything you do and even your Instagram page is full of just pictures and everything that you're very passionate about. So Chelsea, where did this passion come from and where are you from originally? So the passion came from where I come from. (laughs) So I grew up in Hunterdon County, New Jersey in a town called Annandale right outside of Pittstown which is in central Jersey out near PA, a more rural part of New Jersey most people don't know about. And my mother had a dream of having horses. It's something she always wanted. So she bought this five-acre property with the goal of having horses. And we ended up filling it up with goats and chickens. And I started gardening from the ripe young age of six. Was your mom a country gal too? Or did she grow up in more city environment? She grew up in Brooklyn. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she grew up working at Horse Stable in Brooklyn, um, I think near Prospect Park. Okay, so she was around horses and everything growing up, but she just grew up in Brooklyn. Mm Mm-hmm, exactly. Okay, cool. So how did you get started? You said you started at a very young age. I always had gardening through my whole life. Everywhere I ever lived, I just always had a garden. When I lived in Iowa for two and a half years, I begged them to have a garden outside the apartment building. Okay, yeah. I had a garden at every little apartment or rental space that I lived in. And nobody ever told me that farming could be a career option because Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people really thought it was a viable one. And my parents certainly didn't come from farming backgrounds. So it wasn't even something on their radar to teach us about. So for me, I went to school for apparel design and merchandising. Okay. I thought I was going to be a fashion designer, which I don't know how that fits into everything now, but it sort of does in a weird way. Okay, so that's interesting. So you grew up with this passion. You wanted to grow food and everything. And then, so were you pretty passionate about it in high school as well? Or you were kind of drifting away from it at that point? When I got into high school, so to give a little bit more background, um, I was also a 4-H kid all my life. And dairy goats were my forte. I loved raising dairy goats, milking, bottle feeding the babies, showing them. It was just That was my little piece of the farm growing Mm up, besides the growing of the produce. So with that, that's where I learned a lot of the skills about what it takes and the work that it takes to farm. And I guess I'm carrying that now into what I'm doing in some ways. I mean, I have my chickens here. Eventually, one day, I hope to have land where I can have more livestock again. That's great. So that's another piece to the whole thing. So you went to college for fashion? Mm-hmm. What happened there? How Were you getting into it in college or were you like, this just isn't for me? When I was in college, it was kind of a tumultuous 
coming of age journey for me. I ended up, I was originally going to school in Asheville, North Carolina for creative writing. And the school I went to had a farm on campus. Really? That's why I chose to go there. I wanted to learn more about their they had meat production happening for the campus. So it's, it was always on your mind, even yes. though you went to school, for you, you still kind of had in the back of your mind that you wanted to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then I ran away to Iowa to be, things happened in my family. My parents separated, sold the property. I lost my mind. Yeah. I ended up in the Midwest somehow. It was very strange. And that's when I got interested in fashion and pursued that. What was life in uh, Iowa like? Did you like it? It was interesting. It, different. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> different. It's like a different planet. Yeah. The way that people live is just so different. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about how to be more kind to my neighbors there, which is like a weird, that was like my big takeaway was how to be different with people. Whereas in New Jersey, you grow up with this mindset that like, all you have to worry about is yourself and in the West, everybody's kind of more. Yeah. It's a very dog eat dog mentality in New Jersey. That being said, there's also a ton of nice people and beautiful people, but it, you do sometimes get that vibe where it's look out for yourself, do your thing. And yeah, it was a little different out in Iowa. Everybody was a little more friendly. Yeah, it definitely. That was the big lesson. So where, was it, were you farming in Iowa? I had a garden there. Yeah? <laughs> but I wasn't farming. What were you growing? In Iowa, I just did like a little bit of tomatoes, a little bit of peppers, like that kind of thing. Just um, I didn't really understand what actually went into agriculture and growing crops for steady production at that time. And this was just everything you just learned back home growing up, just like little things. Yep. Help grow the crops. Okay. Yeah, but I wouldn't say I was very good at it. Yeah. I was never like a highly skilled gardener. I was just kind of like a, I'm going to grow something and see how it goes kind of gardener. So. Well, I'm sure it's definitely, it's probably definitely hard and it's definitely a skill and you definitely probably have to get good. I, Cause I, I know absolutely nothing about gardening. I would like to start one, but I'm sure it's very difficult now. Mm, yeah, it is. No, it definitely is. Like Every plant has different needs and a different personality, I guess you could call it. So it's a lot of learning. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you're in Iowa at this point. Mm-hmm. And what's going on in your life? You're still kind of doing fashion? Yeah. So as- You said you found fashion in Iowa. Yes, I did. Okay. That's a very interesting place to find fashion. <laughs> exactly. I'm curious about that. <laughs> Well, my ex at the time, his mother actually was an avid sewer. Okay. And in Iowa, as you know, there's not a lot of style. So (laughs) I created this habit of going to the Goodwills, to estate sales, and collecting vintage clothing pieces. And one thing that I wanted to do was alter them to be more modern. Mm -hmm. So I asked my ex's mother to teach me how to use her sewing machine. Mm -hmm. And she taught me like everything. She taught me how to use a sewing machine, a serger, how to hand stitch, like every hand stitch you can think of. And did you pick it up real quick? Yeah. It was a skill that like I had dabbled in as a child. Yeah. Creatively, just like for fun, because my mom had a sewing machine, but it wasn't ever anything kind of like farming now for me. Like it was yeah. never something that I was like, oh, this is going to be my future. Like I yeah. thought I was going to be a writer. I really did. That's interesting too. So what kind of inspired you to be a writer early on? Encouragement in my younger years. First, second grade, I started reading a lot of books and then writing and poetry was one of my biggest things and just had a lot of support from my teachers. That was really the biggest piece. Do you still write? Yes, I do. Yeah. I kind of noticed... I know a couple of people that write and everything, and I feel like even if that's not your quote unquote profession, I feel like people, if you're a writer, you continue to do that throughout your entire life, whether, I don't know, I guess it's a kind of a, an outlet more than anything too. Yeah. It's a creative outlet. It's a, it's something you get into a flow state and you just do. Beautiful. Okay. So you started sewing and you're getting pretty good at it at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually started a business. I had a business. <laughs> yeah. What kind of clothing business was it? The upcycled vintage clothing, and uh, I would do dressmaking and skirts. Dressmaking, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you were making the dresses in the house, and where were you taking them to sell? I sold them on Etsy, and I would sell them in Iowa City. There was a store, I don't know if it still exists, called White Rabbit, and it was like an upcycled vintage clothing store, so it was perfect, like handmade goods, that kind of thing. So would you just walk into that store and be like, hey, I got some dresses here and they would decide if they wanted it or not? How did that work? I met a woman actually. Well, at that time we were both quite young 
And she had hired me as like an unpaid intern to help her with her sewing business. And so she introduced me to them. So the networking thing, something I learned really young. (laughs) So she kind of let you bring your dresses in while you were helping her out? Yeah, she taught me a lot about um, that piece of it. That's great. Okay. So how was that going? It was good, but it was, I was not ready to own a business. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I didn't understand, like, you know, I did everything right. I registered the business, I paid taxes on it. And, but when it got to the point where my demand increased, I, it was just you, it was just me. I was overwhelmed and I couldn't keep up and I just, I was, I gave up. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of interesting because like you got, it got too big for you to handle, right? Mm Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, that's, it's, it's almost like it's a good problem to have rather than like, it's not working. I'm not selling it. It's like, you just got too big. Yeah, exactly. That's an accomplishment in itself. Yeah. Like, so yeah. I think any business owner too, any entrepreneur should have at least one failed business venture under their belt before the big one. So yeah, we can learn. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. Definitely. That process. So that didn't quite work out. And then what was your thought process after that? Well, at the same time that all was happening, my relationship was dissolving. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, it came to this, came to this big point in my life where I had to make a decision. And my decision that I made was to get the heck out of Iowa and Mm -hmm. packed up my car and put my dog in the car and drove to Florida where my dad was. Oh, wow. (laughs) What part of Florida? Captiva Island. (laughs) Have you ever heard of it? No idea where that is. (laughs) It's like in the Gulf. It's like a little vacation getaway kind of place and my dad was happened to be there so I just went yeah so was that nice it was it it was a sad time in my life it was really a difficult time my first serious relationship the craziest relationship that probably any person could go through at that young age of like what I was like 21 oh wow yeah it was it was nuts you've done you did a lot by that time at that age that's impressive (laughs) yeah I lost your own (laughs) business at 21 yeah it was um yeah looking back on it (laughs) <laughs> like you know, exactly. yeah, yeah. I'm sure it was, it must've been absolute hell going through it, but looking back on it, that's very impressive. Yeah. I learned a lot of lessons really fast only because I chose to just dive straight into crazy town. Yeah. Yeah. I just did it. That's good. Some people <laughs> never even take that step. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're down in Florida now mm-hmm. and how's that going? I was just there for a little bit with him. He was on vacation. It was also like through my parents' divorce, there's been a lot of craziness. Yeah. And so he was dealing with his own stuff and that's why he was there. So I went and kind of picked him up and brought him back to New Jersey in a way. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, you guys road trip back up to New Jersey? Yeah. With a plastic rocket ship on the top of the car, actually. Now that I remember, (laughs) it was was a gift for his friend or something. I don't know. It's crazy. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) Yep. It was definitely an interesting thing. So what's your plan at this point? When I got home, I didn't have one. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to figure out like, am I, because I had gotten at that point, just my associate's degree in um, apparel design and merchandising. And I didn't really know where I was going. I honestly, it just like, I was so broken down that I was just trying to pick up all the pieces. Yeah. And I ended up, my friend actually, now she's very successful at this, but she was just starting out on a journey to becoming a production design just for film and television. Yeah. And she knew that I was interested in in apparel and she got me into some costume gigs. Okay. And just started getting me in that path. So I pursued that for a while. I was working, doing like assistant costume design. Did you like it? It was fun in some ways, but I knew it wasn't my true path. Just just like another stepping stone? It was another learning lesson. Yeah, another stepping stone. I got to work on a feature, which was really cool, like a very low budget one, but it finally released a few years later. So that was (laughs) kind of cool to go see that. But the industry to me wasn't a good fit because it was too nebulous. Like there was no guarantee that as hard as you work that you'd get where you wanted to go. Right. It was more a game of like, Knowing people, which was a good lesson to learn. I learned that's helped me now, knowing that piece. What do you mean knowing people? Just like being able to... To read people or like just to... To like, well, it, it's very much so like who you know is how far you get. Okay. In that industry. You have yeah. to know the right people. You have to schmooze the right people and 
the distance between where I was and where I wanted to be was just so long. And I looked at it, like I looked down that path and I was just like, I don't know if I, yeah. I don't know if I want to put all of myself into this because I don't know if this is really what I want to do. Yeah. So I also started working part-time at Nordstrom in Short Hills, New Jersey Okay. <laughs> as a sales girl. And through some time there, I actually ended up putting my focus into that and worked my way up to a manager in that store. Great. And that's where that career started. So becoming a retail manager. Are you still doing that? <laughs> no, I left that in April of last year. I, was, um, I had moved from Nordstrom to Lord & Taylor and then I moved to managing and being a buyer for a boutique in Soho. In Soho, New York? Yeah. New York City? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so that was like... I'm trying to catch up here. You're all over the place. <laughs> Why did you choose to leave like Nordstrom's and you're working your way up there? What happened where you're like, all right, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. This isn't for me. So when I got into that position in New York, I thought that my desire was what I thought I was doing was working my way up to corporate. Mm-hmm buying or like something in that vein, like whether it was buying or merchandising or something like that, part of my, what I studied and my skill set, and very well paid. <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of like what I was looking at. Like that was the carrot that was dangling in front of me. Like I can be at six figures soon. I can be at right. six figures soon. Right. And I was almost there. Like yeah. I, after bonuses and everything, I was really close and yeah. I was only getting more and more miserable the more yeah. money I made. Wow. You sell your soul. You really yeah. do. Especially when it comes to luxury retail and, and corporate retail. It's a very like sick industry right now. Yeah. It trickles down from the top. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that's probably the best advice I've gotten from a couple people is don't chase the money, chase the dream. Like, cause yep. if money is the overall goal, you, you can never have enough. Yep. It's only money and it's going to make you get up and do things you might not want to do. Yeah. But that's pretty amazing that you noticed that and decided to switch over again. Yeah, that was, it was definitely not an easy decision. Between all that stuff that I told you about, I got married. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, luckily I um, have a partner who was very supportive, if not a little bit confused by what I was doing or like a little bit like, is this actually going to work? But he, right. he was very supportive. That's great. You need that. Yeah. So you said you started working in Soho mm -hmm. and what happened there? That's the job that Oh, I, that's the job. Okay. That's the okay. job I left in April. Yeah. When you left in April, did you have an idea what you were going to do or were you? Well, in January of 2017, because I, at that position, I was a buyer as well. I got to travel to Paris to do the buy for the store. Oh, wow. And which was amazing. Like I'd never yeah. been to Europe. So it was definitely like an amazing, beautiful experience. And when I was there was really when I, my wheels started turning. I was reading Market Gardener by Jam Fortier. I was reading books about just how to start a farm and how to get there. And I thought I was going to be working in this career for a long time, saving money, eventually buying land and then figuring it okay. out. Okay. So the goal was to work with the job you're at right now, save some money, and then way down the road, you're going to get like a farm? Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. So on that plane ride home from Paris in January, I wrote down what I wanted to do. And as I was writing it, I realized that I wanted to do it now and not later. That is <laughs> awesome. I think everybody should do that. Just get a clear picture of what exactly you want to happen in life, write it down and do your best to make it happen. Yep, it was a long flight, so I had a lot of time. <laughs> when I got home, I started just kind of downward spiraling in that job mentally. Uh, it wasn't just because of my own self, like my own findings, but it was a transition in my boss as the retail director. It was just a lot of things, and it was also me realizing that I didn't fit there. Yeah. It wasn't me. I had made myself to some, into someone else to fit into that world, and the best way to describe it is I had cutting off pieces of who I was and just dropping it behind me. And yeah. I, I turned around and I saw all of it and I was like, I want all that back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be somebody else. And the nail in the coffin for me was when my boss took me into her office and told me that in order to be successful in this career, in order to advance forward, I needed to stop being kind to my employees. No um, way. Yeah, she told me I was too kind 
And I, that was it. I threw in the towel mentally. I was just like, you know what? I'm not letting go of that piece of who I am because that's all I got left. <laughs> what did you say to, like, say to that at her at that moment? Were you like, okay, and then left or you're like, there's no way? I quietly just kind of like nod in my head. Yeah. But you knew like right then it was like, that's it. Yeah. So I stayed there for a while trying to make it work. And then there was a moment I was visiting my sister in Atlanta. And as you know, as somebody that runs a business, like you're the one who gets the phone calls. Yeah. And something goes wrong in the store. And so I'm there spending time with family, which I rarely had time to do because that job ate up all my life. And I got this phone call from my boss that just sent me into a, the biggest panic attack I've ever had. And like I was in a dark room for an hour and a half. I couldn't move. I was shaking. It, it was. What was the call? Like, why did it send you in such a deep spin? If you don't mind me asking. No, it's okay. Somebody stole something from the store. Like somebody walked in, walked out with something. And long story short, I didn't know how to access the security cameras because nobody trained me on it. Mm -hmm. I assumed that it was like a thing that corporate had, you know, to manage. And my boss called me and told me that basically like kind of just like yelled at me and shamed me telling me I should know how to handle these things. And, you know, I'm not fit for my job. And, mm -hmm. and it was just too much. And there's nothing you can do about it. Cause you're in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it just was too much. It, it, Cause there are other things that happened that were similar, but this was just uncalled for because she was new. I was still relatively new to the company. They had not really given me proper training. And I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants all the time. And so that really just was the final blow. And so I Googled <laughs> farm apprentice positions, New Jersey, right? Wow. And I came to this website and I put in my zip code and it pulls up Clifton, New Jersey. There's a, I'm like, Clif I'm like making sure it's the right town. I'm like Clifton. That's like, yeah. that's like 10 minutes for me. Like, yeah. There's a farm in Clifton. Like, <laughs> So it turned out that that was City Green, in, which is an urban farm, like a nonprofit urban farm in that okay. area. And I reached out to them right away, even though the listing was like three months old. I didn't know if they filled the position and it was a whirlwind, but it happened really fast and they offered me a position. It was 75% pay cut, but it was... A it was what you wanted to do. <laughs> it was the right step and I knew that I needed experience before I tried to do it on my own. I yeah. needed to understand. So yeah, they brought me in, they made a position for me and I managed all their learning gardens all over Patterson. Mm -hmm. And they had a bigger learning farm location beside their five acre farm in Clifton in Patterson Eastside Park. And they said, here, you make this beautiful again because we haven't had time to in years. Wow. It was their first site. You must have been thrilled. It was a lot, but it was, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Because I was working independently in the field most of the time by myself. So it was really just the best way to learn about what I'm doing now. Would you say you were ready to start that, grow up? I think that there were some ways, yes, some ways, no. Skill-wise with actual crops, not ready quite yet. Mm -hmm. but learning about how to create systems and how to manage something like that, it was the best opportunity for me to learn on a very small scale. How did you navigate that then? Because there was definitely some new things that you probably had to pick up quickly. Were you constantly back and forth with them, making sure everything runs smoothly or how did you come up to speed? It was mostly self-taught. I utilized a lot of the resources that are out there now all over the internet for new farmers. One of the big names is Curtis Stone. Um, urban farmer in, in Canada. Jam Fortier, like I said, does the market gardening on a larger scale and just a lot of books. Yeah. A lot of studying. It was like going to school. Yeah. It was like I was getting paid to go to college. And so I just took it that way. I learned everything that I possibly could. And what month is it at this point? That's April. This is last April? Mm hmm. Okay. And when's the best time to start growing right like after the winter? You should really start your prep work in end of January, early February. And then when do you start to plant? It depends on the crop. Okay. Your greens and things like that can go out about now if you have season extension. All right. We'll, uh, we'll definitely get to that. I'm curious. Okay. So is this kind of what you wanted to do? Like is like, it's an urban farm, that patch of land you were managing? It was in some ways, but in some ways it was, it was more educational there. 
Okay. It was more so like their nonprofit was prioritizing educating young children about agriculture and enriching the community in that way. So it wasn't so much about production as it was about education. And how did it, how did it turn out? How were the following months after <laughs> April? <laughs> well, I had many battles with groundhogs. Groundhogs, huh? Yep, that's the biggest rodent pest in this region, I think, for urban agriculture. And I think for most areas, because they are relentless and they are really hard to get rid of, especially in an area like a park where that was. So yeah, they just keep coming because people- How do you manage that? You get creative, trapping them and releasing them at other places, just using as trying out all these different methods of protection, using fencing or row cover or whatever it takes. <laughs> Can they mow down your entire like plot in like one day? Yep. Wow. Yeah. Did that happen? It happened a few times. Damn. <laughs> So it was a lot of falling down and getting back up again, definitely. And then the other issue that came into play was not having a full understanding of nutrition for crops. So, you know, not having high yields because I wasn't focusing on enriching the soil to produce that said crop. So that was the other lesson that I learned. What do you have to do to enrich the soil or what are some things you can do? Well, the first thing is is that- Compost, right? Compost, yeah. Compost definitely helps, but like certain crops are heavier feeders or on certain minerals or things like that. So like, for example, your tomatoes and peppers really need calcium. So if you don't feed them calcium, things happen like blossom end rot, which prevents any sort of fruit from coming into um, the equation or just unhealthy plants in general. And then what happens when you have unhealthy plants is pest problems because they pests are more likely to go after unhealthy plants. Really? Mm -hmm. All right, this might be a ridiculous question, but how do you feed a plant calcium? One of the ways that I like to use, because I have chickens and I have a lot of eggs all the time, is I save the eggshells and then I bake them at like 300 degrees for 40 minutes. And then I put them in a blender and it creates a calcium powder. And I, I save that and I put about tablespoon or two in the hole before I put the transplant into the ground. Are you still working with the farm in Clifton? I do help them from time to time. This year, I still don't really know if I'm going to be there part-time at all. It's something that I'd like to do if I have time, but I don't know if I will. But I do help them with, like, if they have questions about anything or just reacclimating to that little piece of land I was taking care of, I help them with that stuff. And so did you just recently purchase a plot of land? I lease that land. You lease it. Okay. Yeah. Where's that? It's right around the corner from my home in East Orange. Okay. In the first ward. Okay. And so you must have been having a busy winter just getting everything. I think I saw you got some uh, soil. Yes. Shipped in. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, um, we had to build. So for our greens and root vegetable production on the land, we chose to do that on raised beds. So we're in the process of building 11 50 foot raised beds. We have seven done. Beautiful. Four more to go. And what are you growing there? In the beds, it'll be like head lettuce, salad mix. So the salad mix, depending on the season, will maybe just be loose leaf lettuce or with spinach, arugula, tatsoi, which is an Asian spinach kind of thing, and mustard greens and things like that. And then root vegetables too. So like radish, beets, okay. turnips. So I've seen you, a couple of the restaurants are using your produce. So How did you get into that? Did you just start showing up at restaurants and being like, this is what I do? Or how does that work? So the microgreens is like a whole other piece of the farm that started because I wanted to supplement my chicken's diet with greens in the wintertime. And we built like this little makeshift grow light shelving system in in my, now what is my office where I'm sitting right now and learned how to grow those. That started in about, January of last year. So January 2017 is when I started doing that. And then this past fall, we built like a larger system in the basement with lights that could accommodate, I guess, like close to 50 or 60 trays of Mm -hmm. production. And I decided to just call the corner in Montclair and say, hey. I love that spot. (laughs) It's great. Yeah, they're awesome. And Jeff, the owner, is he's an amazing person because he entertained my 
very scattered pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to when I walked in his restaurant with two trays of microgreens and right off the bat said, yes, wow. I will purchase this weekly from you. Wow. Yeah, it was definitely, and like the time, like to kind of give you like a little bit of humor here, my life was quite crazy because I was still like trying to even just figure out what the heck I was doing. Yeah. And when I was, because they were down in the basement, so when I was coming upstairs, I tripped and I fell and I dropped the trays like on the ground and I just like, oh man, like, it was like, oh my God, they're going to think it's terrible. Like the, the shoots were like going like every oh direction. Oh my God. And I like smacked my knee on the ground. I was like running. I, it was crazy. And just the fact that he said yes. The handshake that I gave him was like a really awkward handshake. I felt like <laughs> so bad. <laughs> and when he said yes, I was like, okay, so it's working. Yeah. Even though I, even though I feel crazy, it, it's working. So, that is beautiful. And then my next restaurant after that, shortly after, after I practiced a bit more about my pitch, I got my marketing materials a little bit more tight and like put together. And I approached my favorite restaurant in Montclair, which is Les Sabouins right across from the Walnut Street Station, if you've ever been there. What's it called? Les Sabouins. I haven't been there. What kind of restaurant is that? They're a French restaurant. Wow. It's a husband and wife that own it, and they openly share that they source locally as much as they can. And so I thought it would be a good try, and I also just love their food. And when they said yes, that was like the ultimate yes, green light, go, do this, don't stop. For me, that was a big deal, and they're oh, still absolutely. to this they're still to this date my biggest customer. And so you uh, brought the microgreens into there too? Yes. Okay. Beautiful. It was all just phone calls for those two. And then after that, every, every restaurant that I've accumulated has reached out to me through social media. Wow. Yep. Good for you. What would you like to see this grow into? That's still quite nebulous for me in terms of because a lot of this journey is a lot of just following the path of least resistance um, at this time. But my five-year plan truly is to have a total half acre, a third to half acre of land throughout the city that I'm farming in full production and not just only using part of it, the land to produce. And this year I'm also experimenting with cut flower production, mm -hmm. which I'm hoping might turn into a really large piece of my business which is interesting because as a child and a, a young adult, I always thought growing flowers was a waste of time mm -hmm. because you couldn't eat them. And yeah. Now I'm starting to really appreciate their beauty and wanting to share with people, not just the type of flowers that you buy, like from those mass produced florists that don't even look real anymore, but right. sharing like these beautiful flowers that not only serve as a bouquet, but in your farm, they serve as beautiful supporters of an ecosystem of beneficial insects Wow! Yeah. and life. So I'm really interested to see how that goes. What flowers did you plant? This year I'm going to be doing sunflowers, zinnias, experimenting with a few others that I really like. One is called gumfrina. Gumfrina is a, like a globe type of flower that dries really well and holds its color. So I really like dried flowers because you can save them and have them forever really. And experimenting with that kind of thing too. Awesome. That's unreal. I also wanted to ask you, for someone listening to this, mostly myself, I wanted just to know, what does it take to just start a couple of raised beds garden in your backyard? Obviously, it depends on probably what you're growing and everything, but like just in general, what do you really need to get going? You need some lumber, which you can get untreated lumber. You can get that anywhere, and it's not that expensive. You can do pine boards the last maybe like five or six years before they start rotting. Cedar and hardwoods are best, mm -hmm. but you can start with pine, which is really not that expensive, and some good soil, and yeah, that's really all you need. It's not that hard. When you say good soil, do you mean like compost soil for a while, or is there good soil you can buy that's... Anything that has should have compost in it, and if not, you can top dress with compost and mix it in. But try to stay away from like your Miracle Grow products, things like that. Yeah, what because the pesticides? That and they add a lot of things to their soil, like wetting agents and chemicals like that. And yeah, it's just most places you can find you can just like get like a container soil and then also add compost that works or you can find a farmer that has a lot of soil 
and yeah. see if they can sell you some for a lot cheaper than buying it in bags. Where do you get your seeds from? Several places. Uh, Johnny's is the best for vegetable production in terms of pricing and quality. It's very consistent. But High Mowing Organic Seeds, based in Vermont, they're really great. All their seeds are organic, non-GMO. They're also starting to really step up their game in terms of quality for like high production and consistency. And there's a bunch of other ones. Baker Creek is great for your home gardener. Um, they are an heirloom seed company that travels all over the world to find varieties of beautiful, different, unique uh, vegetables, flowers, herbs. Um, so if you want to try something like that, I feel like that's the best place to start, Baker Creek Seeds. And how long is the process? I mean, if you, if you plant in April, everything goes as planned. What are you looking at to like harvest time? Depends on the crop. Yeah. With your greens, like your leafy greens, those are like a 30 day turnaround time from when you put the seed in the ground for baby leaf. For your lettuce heads, it's more like 55 to 60 days. Tomatoes, you put those in the ground in May and you get your first harvest in July-ish, end of okay. June, July. And how often do you have to water it? Obviously, depending on what it is, but how often do you think you have to tend to your garden? And obviously, what, every day? They need about an inch of water a week. Okay. But you need to tend to it every day because you should always be looking at what's going on and making sure that nothing strange is happening or everybody's healthy. And water is definitely one of the pieces that is probably the most important. You want to make sure that there's consistent watering schedule. And what else do you have to do besides the watering? a key element just to make sure everything's growing right and healthy. You have to like remove like weeds that pop up and all that stuff or? Yeah, definitely weeds. Weed pressure will kill your plants when they're young. Wow. And you, Okay. That's all interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Got to get on it. <laughs> so you've been growing your own food now, what, for the past year or so, right? Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of people say they develop a connection with the food, especially if you're a hunter shooting your own meat. Or if you're a gardener growing your own food, is there a certain type of connection you get with the food? Because I feel like mostly America is not in touch with the food. Most of us just go to the store and buy it and there's no connection there, but you're actually growing it. Do you know that there's like a certain type of connection or there's got to be some type of almost like an endorphin release that you know you grew this, you know where exactly where it came from and you're putting it on your own table. That's got to be an amazing feeling. It is. It it definitely is in in many ways. Um, One of the most important ways is that it cuts out a big piece of our consumer society, which is that we go to a grocery store to buy our food. When you're able to be independent in that way and have the opportunity to grow your own food, you realize that we don't really need much in this life. We just need good food, good water, and family, and and our health. Yep, shelter and good people. Yeah, exactly. So that's the biggest piece, but it's also the flavor. Um, It makes you realize that when you buy stuff at the grocery store, it took weeks to get on your plate. And so the nutrition loss Mm -hmm. with that, you can taste that when you pick something and you eat it fresh out of the ground or fresh off the vine. It's definitely for your taste buds and for your body. It's like a different experience. And it really like it, whether or not it's a placebo or not like you know sometimes like it's like i don't know if this really tastes better but i think it it does just i think it's got it it's got <laughs> it definitely yeah so there's that piece of it too and the biggest place to see that so clearly is with with my eggs that i have for my chickens um because i know all the inputs that go into what they eat and yeah. so when i eat that egg and i crack that open you can see the difference oh absolutely yeah it's, you can definitely see the difference between like a just like a massively produced egg and then an organic egg. The yolk is a completely different color. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And just the consistency and the flavor too. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, I would love to check out what you got going on. Maybe like when it starts getting warmer out, if you don't mind, I'd love to come by, see, see what you got going on. That's great. Yeah, of course. We'd love to have you. So where can people find you on social media and you have a website or anything? Uh, Yep. I have the Instagram is where you it's most active. Um, you can find us there. It's just the handle's just the farm name carousel with dots in between. How do you spell that? C O E U R dot E T dot S O L. Perfect. Okay. That's the most active thing you got going on social media wise. So people can find you on there. 
Yeah, I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and I have a website too, which is just carousel.farm. So C-O-E-U-R-E-T-S-O-L dot farm. Well, Chelsea, thank you for coming on. You're a beautiful soul. Thank you. I really appreciated uh, you coming on and just telling me what you're all about. And I thought it was a great episode. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. My private practice is located in New Jersey at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. If you have any additional questions about today's podcast, other episodes, or any questions about Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractic in general, feel free to visit my website at drkevinpecca.com or subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Kevin Pekka. Hope you enjoyed the show. Cheers.